if you could give us a little description of that. What kind of boats did you use and, and what was your schedule like and why? Our company was called Grand Canyon Dories and we didn't expect every other company to be like that. Uh, we used dories and we didn't uh, augment the trip with rafts or motor rigs or anything like that. Later on we took some training rafts occasionally down, small rafts that would uh, uh, sometimes be called baggage boats and so forth. But the people went in dories, which we thought were, and we know are, the best way to go. And uh, they appreciated the canyon, they enjoyed the ride, and we stopped where we could see things that were very special. And sometimes we'd spend a day or part of a day uh, concentrating on these wonders of nature that are all through the canyon and unseen by many of the people who come through, and many of whom don't care whether they see them or not. Thunder Spring is one, of course. Um, so we ran a longer trip, not rushing. On the other hand, it wasn't just a dawdling trip. 18 days to Pierce Ferry uh, is not just floating. You're making time. When you allow for the stops you make, which maybe will represent two nights, often two nights at Monument Creek, two nights at Chuar Creek, uh, that allows for people to go and see things that are very special to the Grand Canyon, two nights at Tapete's Creek. And uh, so it was more than just a float down the river and uh, a chance for people to say, well, I've been down the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. Uh, to me, that was, uh, that's not the purpose of being here. The purpose of being here is to soak it up. And we realized we were here along with all the other people and our impact was here too. So we tried to minimize it in every way and tread lightly on the earth. Um, how'd you come to name the boats? Uh, how'd we come to name the boats? I don't remember what inspired me to do this, but uh, there were so many places of wonder and beauty, natural places on the earth. And sometimes they weren't 100% natural, but they were lovely and wonderful that are being lost, they're still being lost. And I felt we need to remind ourselves of what we're throwing away in this world, what we've given up, what we've allowed to be destroyed. And so the names for the boats began to memorialize uh, the Earth's natural wonders, big and small, that uh, uh, have been lost, destroyed in one way or another, or badly injured by human activity. So we named boats after the places you're familiar with. Reached all around the world. Most of them in this country though, of course. This is where we're most sensitive to places in the Colorado River system, of course, people on the Colorado River are most sensitive to. And a lot of places under Lake Powell which would not have been named Lake Powell if Powell had anything to say about it. I think that was the biggest insult to Powell there ever was. Uh, a guy who's dead and can't defend himself has to have his name attached to that thing. But uh, uh, at least under Lake Powell, there are a lot of wonderful places that will never be wonderful again as long as that thing is there. Uh, and uh, um, we use those. Uh, as you know, uh, Music Temple and Hidden Passage, Moki Steps, uh, the other things you think about up there. Um, well, what about this trip? How what about what? Well, this trip this here trip? that we're on now, um, why did you come? Why did I come? Yeah, and, what do you, and what's it been like for you? Like, well, how I got a free trip. <laughs> I didn't have to organize the trip. It's so wonderful just to come and row a boat. And uh, I got to see some old friends after a long time. Some of them I hardly ever knew. And, uh, but I knew of them. And uh, you realize that some of these people are, they predate me. Lois Jodder, most wonderful person you can think of who came down here in 1938, 38, 48, 
something like nearly 20 years before I took a boat through here. And uh, here she is, big as life. And uh, so coming on this trip was a temptation, as long as I had an opportunity to bring my boat, to bring a boat, which I bought for this trip, and uh, to be with the crew, too, the people that, that I've known in my own organization, you, Brad, and others who are here, Kenton, of course, Diane. Uh, these are things that made the trip attractive. And it was going at a nice time of year, from the standpoint of weather. Um, it's a it's a good assembly. It's a good way to put people together, and uh, it's the only thing of its kind that'll ever happen in history, where the old timers, as they're called, those available, could get together, and not only reminisce but put on record their memories of what was here, and. Uh, I know it's changed a lot, and some of them have expressed uh, their recognition of the changes. But uh, it's not easy to remember the changes as you go along, because the level of the river changes everything anyway. Uh, I think Bob Rigg has been one of those who's been most sensitive, uh, because after all, he did great things on this river a long time ago. In 56, which was the second year I'd ever gone down here, he and his brother uh, at that time set the all-time record for any kind of a craft going down the, the Grand Canyon, motored or rowed, motor-driven or ore-powered, and uh, uh, they did a very spectacular thing, the two of them. Something that's been eclipsed since then by Kenton Grua, who's also on this trip, uh, in a dory with two other members of our uh, former crew at Grand Canyon Dories. So I guess that gives me a little satisfaction <laughs> that a dory holds the all-time record and probably the all-time record there will ever be for any craft going through the canyon. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, it, these motorboats lug through here in eight or nine days, and, and here three guys with a pair of oars come shooting down here in 36 hours, and what the purpose of that is, I can't say, except it was done. And it was done by human power without the benefit of internal combustion, uh, as the Rig brothers' trip was. So it says something about human muscle. <laughs> I don't think you want to hear anymore. Well, I don't know. What are we forgetting? I don't know we what to say. This is just blabber. My, no, it isn't. Here goes my uh, intellectual question mark. Today you did something. Are you that, taking pictures? <laughs> I, I am. Today you did something that really intrigued me. That I would consider to be uh, Abby Abby esque, like as an Edward Abbey. He wrote. I didn't pursue you, did I? <laughs> no, well, that that would be Abby esque <laughs> too. Well, I can do it if you want. That's okay. Our path. Oh shit! Wait, <laughs> we got. Is that a battery? Yeah. Oh, we got to change a battery. Just. Okay, I've tell got me. This great question. Okay. Okay, well, you, you probably did. have a one word answer. Yeah, can you get one? <laughs> oh. At a, a party for the book. Her bar. first book. Pat the Bunny. Oh. <laughs> okay, fire away. All right. Well, today you did something that reminded me of a moment in Desert Solitaire. And in Desert Solitaire, Edward Abbey is playing around with, with a slingshot. He's spinning around and he sees a rabbit go by. And so he spins it around and smack hits this rabbit and kills it. And I thought, oh my God, this is Edward Abbey in Desert Solitaire, and he just killed this rabbit, and he felt a little bad about that. But today, while we were rowing, there was that little business card sitting on the deck that didn't make it in the box, and we are getting ready to go through a riffle, or maybe 185, and it got tossed in the river. And what is that about? The little business card that you saw was a card that was printed with my name on it, as the founder and chairman of the Sequoia Alliance. Well, whether that's true or not, I had nothing to do with the way that card was printed. It didn't even have my address on it or phone number. It had the address and phone number of the Sequoia Alliance. <coughs> Wait a minute, I'll go back to that. Uh, I had nothing to do with the way that card was put together. 
And uh, I thought it was pretty fatuous to have a business card saying, you're founder and chairman of something. I would just rather have my name on it, and that's all. I didn't, I wasn't, the identification part of it wasn't necessary. Uh, and so I haven't used those cards. And one of them was in my ammo box, and uh, where I do have some, uh, some cards that I put together about the Sequoia situation, a very simple one, my name on it. And so I haven't given anybody that card. And uh, when it went overboard, I thought it was the Lord's will and that somebody would find it someday uh, buried in the rock and it would become a fossil and nobody down here would be allowed to pick it up. Just as they won't be allowed to touch your beer cans if you leave them in the river. Those will be antiquities. You see, what we are required to protect was another generation's junk. When, it, when Indians threw away broken pots, that was trash to them. We're not allowed to pick it up and, you know, and clean up the canyon. Did I answer your question? You did. How okay, about, we're done. How about you, Jeff? You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to wish you'd ask a bunch more. What is it? What are we forgetting here? Dinner time. Oh, that, that too. Martin, what, what is it that people today need to know? You've talked a lot about an, environmental importance of the canyon, and that's, that is a very clear message. But is there anything else that people today need to know about the past to understand where we need to head? Well, you know, it's been said that those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, you can't repeat what we've done here because once it's done, it's done. Um, I'll switch that question a little bit, if I may, because I don't know how to answer it. Um, it's not important that we physically enjoy being here. What's important is that it's here. And I think a lot of satisfaction, a lot of pleasure in wilderness is experienced by people who never go to the wilderness or who rarely do or maybe can't or may someday or may, may have in the past, can't do it anymore because it's knowing it's there. That's where the real satisfaction is. And sometimes, if you think it's there, you're enjoying it. If you go there, you may not enjoy it. It may not be what you hope for, uh, what you idealize. Uh, Yosemite, for example. To go there now is, is torture for a person who remembers how beautiful it was. And the Grand Canyon hasn't gotten to that point yet. It's uh, uh, a vaster distance, but uh, George Miller, congressman from California, who is a good environmental legislator, said something in a program that I was involved in which made me wince. I don't think he really meant it. I don't think he thought about it before he said it, but we're trying to establish a national preserve among the giant sequoias which have been at the mercy of the national forest system. And of course, they're out to murder everything in sight. We've had to sue and so forth, and many of us have become paupers because of it, um, trying to stop what our government is doing to the most wonderful forest, as John Muir said, the noblest forest of the world. And. Uh, Congressman Miller was asked about this, and he had never been informed about the preserve that we're trying to establish, uh, which is, of course, not ideal. It's not ideal to set something aside. It would be better if everyone understood what the values are, and it didn't need to be set aside, like here. And he came on this program, which I have a tape of. We countered it a little bit later on, but he said, well, you can't just draw a line around something and think you've protected it. That doesn't work. We're interested in ecosystems. I just, ooh, I said, George, why did you say that? Maybe you can't protect everything by drawing a line around it, 
but that's the only thing we've ever been able to do. Grand Canyon National Park had a line drawn around it, and that's why it has some measure of protection. Every national park, every wilderness, every national monument, every state park, it's got a line drawn around it, and there are things you cannot do inside that line, and that's what the protection is. But to think that you're going to convert people into ecologists overnight, the way some of these idealists seem to think we can do, that's the fallacy. Better get those lines drawn and then hang on to them. And eventually they'll coalesce. Eventually we will care. Uh, I know people who you shouldn't really expect this of, but they'll take a drive for a vacation up through Oregon and Washington, and they'll come back home outraged even though every effort is made to keep the tourists from seeing these things, the logging, the destruction of the land, mainly by logging, also by mining and grazing, people can't believe it. They can hardly believe they've seen that, and they don't know what to do about it. They don't know where to turn. They don't know what club to join. Uh, they're fighting mad, but we haven't given them the instruments uh, through which they can vent their, their outrage and uh, help to protect and save what we have what we had, because we've lost most of them. So we'd better draw some lines, and we better do it in a hurry, and that's one of my projects, to get to Congressman Miller and point out to him that we'd better draw a lot more lines before we think that we've converted our people uh, to the point where they're going to take care of nature. As long as there are projects, as long as there are businesses, as long as there's money to be made by sacrificing nature, people are going to do it. And uh, it's too bad, but the jobs issue is the, the worst thing we face. You can cut yourself right out of a job in the Northwest without even realizing it and then blame the uh, environmentalists for stopping the, the logging. The logging stopped because you cut all the trees down. And uh, that's, that's the story of nature everywhere. Here we don't have an immediate extractive industry because it's just a bunch of rocks. <laughs> but there used to be people trying to take things out of the Grand Canyon. Old Hans with his asbestos mine. And Georgie started an asbestos mine in Tapeats Creek, you know. And her brothers were hauling asbestos down the river in pontoon rafts. And uh, the amounts were ridiculous. And then we had the bat guano mine down here, you know. And uh, so people, if there were anything here to get, they'd get it. But thank God there isn't anything. And, uh, Georgie had an asbestos mine? Her brothers were mining asbestos. Right Georgie next. Clark's brothers. Georgie White Clark, yeah. Yeah. And uh, You know the trail where you go up? No, I don't yeah. think there's any trace anymore. Where you go up to the that, that slide or that talus, you go up to where you hit the level, and then you go along the ledge to where the shovel used to be and all that. On the way up there, you come to an overhang and it used to be, before people picked away at it too much, that the layers of rock were actually asbestos. And if you stuck your finger in there, you could pull out these asbestos fibers that big. You could pull out a whole handful of them. And Georgie got all excited about that. And her brothers began to dig that asbestos up and put it in rafts and bring it down to sell it. Well, you know, it takes an awful lot of asbestos to be worth anything. And now it's not worth much because they don't use it. Uh, Yet all of us grew up with asbestos, and, Here you know, are. yeah. <laughs> so it's so stupid, the things we go through. People in a restaurant will say, oh, I can't stay here. There's a man smoking over there. And they'll go out and stand on the corner waiting for the signal to change, and 500 cars will go by, and they don't pay the slightest attention. <laughs> and they're getting a lot more poison then than they get out of 10,000 cigarettes or whatever. Well, you don't want this. Well, I don't know. We're what, just talking now. I mean, yeah. I've said everything I know and then obviously more than I know. What do you think, Jeff? You got any questions? If you think of anything great, we'll do it tomorrow, but I don't think you will. Okay, well, I got to copy your... Huh? I got to... Uh, the one thing, I want to record your little that tape from your little machine, but that's just a what tape? Oh, the little cassette tape that you keep playing on your machine. I gotta remember.
Well, I gotta remember to do that, but I gotta do it when it's kind of quiet. We got a little too much water noise oh, up there now. Maybe the batteries are worn out. No, they were playing something else. Now. Are they double A batteries? No, I'm, they're C's. Yeah. They're probably all right. Well. That's we're, Joe Carr. I mean, that's all we've got is this hinky tinky honky tonk piano stuff. Well, I just think it's cool. Okay. We're out of here. Okay, what time? Oh my god, it's after 6 p.m.